Today is Baptism Sunday. And I felt the Lord laid, laid on my heart to give us a very, 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 very popular, well-known passage of Scripture. At least it should be if we've been in uh, Christianity for any amount of time. But I'm going to read this to you. And then we're going to preach on it in just a minute. Baptism Sunday. It's in the book of Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, if you get there, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. We'll have uh, maybe the New King James Version, but at least we'll have a version of that uh, on the screen shortly. Matthew chapter 28, we'll go verses 16 through 20. This is known as the Great Commission. Now I want to paint the picture before we read this. Jesus has risen from the dead. Okay? He's been making appearances in his heavenly form for 40 days he has showed up back at Galilee he's ate fish with his disciples he has shown up in other rooms he has shown up to Thomas said stick your hands through my, my scars and, and feel and, and know and believe Thomas you believe because you've seen blessed are those who believe that do not see he has reconciled Peter he's restored him amongst the other brethren saying do you love me Peter says yes Lord you know I love you then feed my sheep Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, I'll ask you a third time. Do you love me? Lord, yes, you know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Three times for the three times he had denied Christ. I was erasing all of that. So all that has taken place. There has assembled a large group of around 500 plus on the countryside with the risen Lord. And they're about to see a miraculous sight. The Bible says Jesus is literally about to lift off the ground and and rise into the heavens and, and get beyond their sight and literally disappear into the heavens. Before he does, he's got them all together. This is Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. says this, Then the eleven disciples went away to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But listen, here's the thing. But some doubted. In, even with the miracle of the risen Lord, with his evident scars and all that stuff, some doubted. Sometimes I have people ask me, said, well, Pastor, if, if, if God would just do miracles nonstop, like if there would just be constant, constant miracles, the world couldn't deny him. Yeah, they would. We've been doing it from the, from the dawn of time of our creation. We doubt and we deny. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them baptizing them not just preaching to them not just singing worship songs together not just having church but make disciples he didn't say make church members he didn't say make fans or followers he didn't even say make believers he said make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And in one of the other synoptic gospels, we see Jesus rise and the angels appear because as he's going up into the heavens, he's beyond out of sight, and they're all just standing there looking. I can understand why they've just seen an absolute miracle. It's mind-numbing, mind-blowing. They're watching this this Jesus, this risen Lord, rise and go beyond their sight into the heavens. And they're just beholding. They're beholding the presence and glory of God. Friends, there's nothing wrong with beholding the glory of God. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing when God's presence is there and we take time to behold. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't say, hey, just sit here and worship and behold my glory. He gave them something to do, right? And so the angels have to, literally the, the Bible says angels had to appear and say, hey, What's the deal? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. What's the deal? Why, why y'all just standing there with your hands in your pockets looking like, you know, you're just going to be here all day? What they really said is, why stand ye gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus who has ascended before you will in like manner come again. Saying, listen, what are you doing just looking up? The same way, he, he's coming back that same way. Now, don't you have something to do? Don't you have some business to attend to? And friends, that business 
was making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptism is a very beautiful thing. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But this is the mandate for the church. Still to this day, if we're not careful, we will become beholders. Let me explain to you what a beholder is. A beholder is somebody who comes to church and really enjoys the church and they like having church and they like being at church but all their faith walk consists of is being in His presence. That's all we want. I get it. I want to be in His presence all the time too. I get it. When we're together, and that's the, that's the beauty of it, right? When we assemble together, Jesus said, when two or three of you are gathered together in my name, there I'll be in the midst of you. So we have a guarantee that when we gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that his presence is in the house with us. Some of you have felt the glory of God already in the building today. Some of you doing your worship have felt the presence of the Lord on, in your spirit. I know I have today. I felt it this morning when I got up and got in the shower and just began to pray and pray for today's service. And got along with God all the way here. Just felt God's glory. And that's a beautiful thing. And we should always want to bask in His glory. However, it cannot stop with us becoming beholders of His glory. Because if we, become, if we, if we stop at beholders, we, we cease to become disciple makers. And the American church for so many years, we have stopped at beholders. The goal for us has been to get into God's presence. And once we get there, we want to stay there. And I know that's how, listen, it's beautiful. I, and for some of you are saying, I have no idea what you're talking about, Pastor Josh. Well, I feel sorry for you, friend. I'm not mad at you. I'm not judging you. But from somebody who has been in God's weighted glory and in the presence of Almighty God Himself, you just don't know what you're missing. And if you wanted to experience that yourself, I can, I can tell you how to make it happen. Ready? Now, here's how I can tell you the difference between beholders and disciples. What you do this week is you take a day or a couple days and you fast and instead of eating your lunch time you spend that hour that you would have been eating lunch and you go get along with God in your car on your lunch break at the job and say God I need your glory more than I need this food and I'm going to stay here and pray and worship until I get your presence in this vehicle but some of us don't know how to do that because we don't know how to pray why? because we're so used to just beholding his glory we don't even know how to pray even though the Bible tells us how to pray right? If you want to be in God's glory, you get somewhere and get along with God and say, I'm not leaving here, God, until your presence fills this place. And I promise you, if you'll wait long enough, he'll show up. The thing is, we're not quite as committed as Daniel for praying 21 days straight. We're, and a lot of us aren't really committed to pray for 21 minutes. If we ain't got something in the first two minutes, we're just moving on. There's a reason why YouTube shorts were created. Minute video clips. Twitter started all that mess, 140 characters. And now we've become such a microwave society, if we can't get the gist of it in a minute, we're moving on to another clip. I'm serious, that's what, that's what happens. We get bored so quick. Do you know I had to teach myself, uh, a, a few months back, I caught myself watching TV, and while I was watching a show that I actually liked watching, I pulled up YouTube. I said, what am I doing? Like I've become addicted to having something fresh to see even though I'm watching something that I want to see and I'm interested in, i got to see something else. Huh? The whole Coco Melon phenomena. Changing scenes every four seconds. I had to talk to Pastor Carr. Our production team became Coco Melon's production team on our live stream. The scenes would change every three seconds. Here's me, here's Taylor, here's me, here's the crowd, here's this, here's the floor. Here's... I said, we got to do something. Y'all making me dizzy when I watch the live stream back. I can't. So I get it. That's, that's how we're driven now. But anything that has any real worth or value doesn't happen like this. Right? Building a career don't happen like this. A job happens like this. There's, there's for hire. There's help wanted signs all over the city. You can get a, Listen, I can tell any business and say, walk-in interviews available. You ain't even got to set a time. Just come in and say, I can carry drinks. You're hired. I got a car and can show up on time good we'll take you you can get a job like this but to build a career don't happen like this you hear what I'm saying hobbies happen like this passions take a lot longer than this beholding happens like this making disciples doesn't happen like that being grounded in the word of God don't happen like that building a relationship don't happen like that now cheap listen, listen some of y'all it's your fault that your kids ain't out of here 
we, we send them, okay? Because some of the content, because we live in a very real world, sometimes I want to meet us where we are, and some of that might not be good for a seven-year-old to hear, right? But guess what? Cheap sex happens like this. <laughs> Meeting somebody at a bar and going and getting, getting your groove on happens like this. Love don't happen like that. Relationships don't happen like that. That's called a booty call. And because our culture is built around the sudden gratification, because our societies and we have we've bought into the instant gratification, if we're not careful, we will reduce a relationship with the Lord to a once a week or once a, once a month visitation and expect his presence to show up in our life like he's some kind of cheap booty call. And he's not. God's glory don't do like that. God don't act like that. God says, you got to know me. We've got to be in a relationship. You got to take my last name. You got to take my name before that happens. I know some of you, I know that seems foreign to us, but that's how God operates. It takes time to build and cultivate. Pastor, what's this got to do with baptism and, and discipleship? Because that's what we're called to do. We're not called to be beholders. We're not called to live instantaneous gratification when it comes to being a born-again Christian. We're not called to just have the Sunday morning experience, yet how many of us have settled for such things? We settle for the Sunday morning fun time. Man, I like the way Pastor Josh sings when he gets high. I like, ah, I like it. I like the way Pastor Jakari gets up there and takes up the offering and starts preaching for 10 minutes. Yeah, I said it back there. You heard me. Man, I like the way we have these nationality flags on the wall and our church does mission stuff. Man, I like the way that we have all kind of different ethnicities and, and all these different cultures in the house. And it is a beautiful thing. Praise God for it. I love it. I love it. But it's not about this Sunday morning. This Sunday morning is supposed to be what helps fuel us through the rest of the week. It ought to be a catalyst that drives us to his presence, drives us to his word, drives us into seeking his face in prayer. But we've become beholders. Wow. He didn't say behold my glory. He said go make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Listen, listen, those of you that are being baptized today, I want you to understand this is not a, this is not a moment. Baptism is not an experience. It is a visible, symbolic, and spiritual change that something is changing forever. It's not a moment. It's a relationship. It's not a day, it's a lifetime. We don't come up here and get baptized and then go back living our same old lives. Well, I got baptized, I'm good, I'm going to heaven now, so let me go back to where I was. No, 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 no. This is a life-changing moment. And if you're going to be baptized, you need to realize that you're selling the world and everybody in this building today and, and God himself. God, I'm entering into communion with you. I'm entering into relationship with you. Today, I'm, I'm letting the world know, today I'm going to stop being a beholder. Today, I'm going to stop being a Sunday morning person. Today, I'm going to stop being church-driven. I'm going to be God-driven. I'm going to be... See, because it takes disciples to make disciples. And it's one reason why we don't make more disciples is we don't have enough disciple makers because we ourselves are not disciples. See, the word disciple is the root word of another famous word that we all know. Ready? What is it? Discipline. Well, we don't have much of that nowadays, do we? Some of y'all that's got youngins. I'm sorry, let me. <clears throat> Some of you that have children. For those watching live stream, Pastor Josh can use other words as well. Let me tell y'all how I grew up. I grew up with go pick a switch. And if it ain't big enough, you're going to go get another one. If I don't like that, then I'm going to get it myself. There was psychological warfare and discipline. There was fear being instilled in my behind. Oh, God. Oh, God. Well, that's abuse. No, it ain't. You know what it did? Let me tell you what it did. When everybody else was going and getting drunk and trying drugs and drugs being passed around, you know what stopped me? The fear of my dad beating my ever-loving behind. And it kept me out of jail. It kept me out of the hospital. 
It kept me from having a DUI. It kept me from sleeping with gals I wasn't married to when I was 16 years old because I knew if, I, if my dad found out, I was a dead man. I had discipline. Discipline breeds, here's why. Discipline breeds respect and reverence. Reverence is a holy fear, a healthy fear. Well, since your dad beats you like that, I bet you don't even talk to him today. We have one of the best. I wish every father-son had a relationship with me and my dad do. It's amazing. I love him. I grew up in the man was my hero. I idolized him even when he tore my tail up. You know why? Because discipline also shows that you love the person discipline. You care enough to make yourself uncomfortable. You care enough to know that the momentary pain or the momentary discomfort this person is going to feel or deal with is for their betterment and for their good later on down the road. That's what discipline is. It's not just that. Discipline is also how we live our lives. For those that go to the gym every day, I applaud you. Thank God for your discipline. I can't do it. I wish I could. I go two or three days a week. I try two in the mornings, get in there. Listen, don't, woo, don't let it. I'm making gains, baby. I started in the middle of January. I leg pressed 450 pounds 15 times. Oh! I could work out more if my boss man would give me some time off. Amen. But it takes discipline. Everything of value. You don't go work out one time and wake up tomorrow morning with bulging biceps. You don't go work out once a week and have your body transform in a month. So why do we think going to church once a week is going to transfer our spiritual status? Well, I've been going to church every Sunday for two months and I don't feel no different. Well, duh. There's no discipline in that. It takes discipline to make time when you don't have time. Now, here's the thing. We have time. We just don't think we have time because we substitute so many things in our time, whether it's YouTube on our, on our phones or Netflix on the screen or something else on the laptop or everything else going on with you. We, the fact of the matter is it's always been this way. We always make time for the things we want to make time for. We, we control it. Anything else is a lie. I'm sorry, it is. It's a lie. And it's a convenient, comfortable lie because then we have an excuse for why we're not progressing. Right? It takes time. We've got to be disciplined. It takes discipline to set aside time to read your Bible every day. It takes discipline to set, a, set aside time to pray every day. It takes time, discipline to set aside time to worship and seek God. It takes discipline to set aside time to be a part of a small group or some part of a ministry. It takes discipline to show up on Sundays at 8.15 in the morning when nobody else is going to be here for two and a half hours, but you're here serving today, so you're here running the sound, and you're getting used to what's going on. That takes discipline to do that every week. It takes discipline to not have to be in here every Sunday because you know the children need love and need to see Jesus in their lives. So you give up some of your Sunday morning so you can go serve the kids. That takes discipline. Anybody with me? Anybody? So we got to be disciples in order to make disciples. There's got to be a discipline. Not followers, not fans, not just believers, but disciples. And that word disciple means somebody who is disciplined, somebody who is, who's got that part of their life. That is, that is who we are. That's what we have every day. That's what we seek. That's what we know. Even when it's not easy, we have the discipline to keep going. That's, what happens. That's why I make my sons play sports. I do. Well, you shouldn't make your kids play sports. Yes, you should. Number one, it's good for their little bodies. They need exercise. Number two, it teaches teamwork. Number three, it teaches how to face and deal with adversity. Number four, it creates mental toughness. Number five, it creates physical toughness. And that's what, never mind, I'm about to win on a, whoo, I about went on a, I about went on a little rabbit trail right then. All these video gaming 24 hours, I want to, I don't even know what a Twitch is, but I've heard about it. How many of y'all know what Twitch is? Anybody? I don't. Thank you. See, none of us do because we're normal. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But all this stuff going on, it's good. It, building discipline builds character. It produces fruit. Same way you can't go plant a garden today. I can't go put seeds in the ground and water them one time today and expect to come back in three months and there'll be fruit on the vine and it to be a beautiful, productive garden. That's not how gardens work. That's not how seeds work, amen? If I'm going to plant my seeds today, I've got to till the ground, plant them, water them. I've got to come back tomorrow, water them again. I've got to come back the next day, water them again. And when I see weeds trying to encroach on my seeds, I've got to then clear the ground again. It takes dedication. It takes discipline. And if I will tend that garden, if I have the discipline to maintain it and water it every day, then it will be healthy and produce fruit for me. 
Thus is our faith. Pastor, I've tried, but I can't seem to win somebody to the Lord. Are you tending your garden? Have you become a disciple? Have you put the discipline of being a Bible reader in your life? Have you put the discipline of being a prayer person in your life? Have you put the discipline at all if you've ever tried to fast anything? Have you put, here's one, have you, have you even tried to tithe and give? Have you had the discipline to, to stop sinning just at will? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I understand that. We all make mistakes. To err is human. To lie on the spot happens, right? You, you get in a moment, you feel pressured, you create a white lie to get out of trouble or to spare somebody's feelings or whatever. You didn't intend to. You just got caught up in the moment and you told a little white lie, okay? A lie's a lie. But there's a difference in that and somebody who schemes and plans and manipulates and lies to somebody willfully just to get ahead. You get what I'm saying? So have we reached the point where, where, where our lives are disciplined, where we're not trying to sin, we're trying to... We're trying to reel in the flesh. We're trying to do the right things, not just spiritually, but mentally, emotionally, physically. Well, pastor, how do you do that? The Bible says it this way, that we should crucify our flesh daily with its lust and its passions. Well, how do you do that? You've got to tell your body, your mind, yourself, we're not doing this anymore. I'm not going left. I'm going right. I'm not going to sit. I'm going to stand. I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to get up. It's really not hard. It's just, are we willing? to be disciple makers, to be baptized, and then to baptize those into the kingdom of heaven. What baptism rep represents, by the way, it's, it's a, a, a deeply spiritual thing. I want you to guys to understand, baptism is not just a physical occurrence. According to the word of God, this is a supernatural event that happens. Whether you feel it or not, it's a supernatural event. It's symbolic, but it's also supernatural as much as it is physical and anything else. To be baptized represents the body going under the water almost like being buried, the old person being buried, and what comes out of the water is the representation of Christ coming out the grave. What was old dies and stays in the bottom of that pool, and the new creation rises, and what was on that, you get what I'm saying? That's what baptism is. It's saying, Lord, the old me is dead and gone. The old me stayed buried in that baptism pool, but the new creation in Christ Jesus, the child of God, the son or daughter of God is what came out of that baptism pool, and I'm gonna leave I'm going to leave those habits. I'm going to leave those desires. I'm going to leave those passions. I'm going to leave those self, my God, have mercy. I'm going to leave those selfish ways behind, and I'm going to live my life as a disciple trying to make disciples, be a disciple maker for the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to be different than being a Sunday morning beholder. I know our schedules are difficult. I know Life happens, and trust me when I say I know. I'm in that stage right now where I'm busy all the time. I got a 14-year-old and 12-year-old because they play sports, because they're in after-school clubs and stuff, which they should be, because of working basically two jobs, everything else. It's, I know what time is like. I get it. I know it can be difficult, but we got to be disciplined and make up our mind that's what we want to do, that we're willing to do it. And why are we doing it? For some cause? For some message that Pastor Josh has preached on a Sunday morning to try to grip your heart and mind and intention, to try to shift your focus and how it should be. No, we do it because he laid down his life. He laid down his life for you and me. My dad used to tell me this, and it didn't make sense that I really got into the word, but he said, he said, Josh, you know, son, if you had been the only person on planet Earth and it would have took Jesus Christ to die on a cross just for you, just the one, he still would have done it. He'd have done it because that's how important you are. That's how much he loves you. That's how much you mean to him. So you've got to understand today, why do we do this? Why become disciples? Why be baptized? Why, why make disciples? Is because we are representing how our response to what he did for us. He died on my cross so that I wouldn't have to. He paid the price of my sin so I could be free. He paid the price of my sin debt so I could be born again. And because he loved me, we used to sing a song, Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. And I'm about to close, and we're going to dismiss those that are being baptized in just about 45 seconds to a minute. There's a song, an old hymn, called When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. On which the Prince of Glory died. I count all my things as lost and poor content on all my pride. Love, 
Here's my favorite stanza. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my heart, my all. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my heart, my all. The revelation of what he did for us, what he's done for me. When I realized, truly realized and had the revelation of the price Christ paid for me, my only reasonable response is to commit my life to him. Anybody here ever seen the movie The Count of Monte Cristo? with Jim Caviezel and Guy Pierce. It's a wonderful movie, The Count of Monte Cristo. You could read, how many of y'all read the book? You may have read the book in school. Some of y'all need to read more. You don't, have to, you, you don't have to start reading when you graduate. You know, it's good for vocabulary and learning and Lord have mercy. In this movie, there's a scene where, and in the book, there's, there's a scene where the, the main protagonist is in a knife fight. And the reason he's in the knife fight is he's, he's broken out of this dungeon in prison. He's trying to get back and, and build a life and get revenge on those who had done him wrong and win back his love who had been taken from him. And so he happens upon this pirate crew, and they say, we ain't got room for one, but I tell you what, you can fight this guy that, we, that had stole from us, and we're going to kill him anyway, so whichever one of y'all wins this knife fight can be on the crew. The other one's a dead man. And the main protagonist wins the knife fight but refuses to kill the man. He won't do it. He spares his life. He says, I won't do it. Either take both of us or take neither of us. I'm not, I cannot kill this man. I will not kill him. He spares his life. Because he spared his life, the man gets up and goes to him and says, truly from this day forward, I'll be your servant because I owe you my life. I wouldn't even have a life without you. So I, I'm going to, for the appreciation of the life that you've given me, the life that you afforded me, I'm going to spend that life serving you now. The reason it's in that book is because that was a common occurrence. That was common when somebody spared your life, when somebody uh, did some kind of grandiose thing and they spared your life or saved your life. It was common to say, I'm going to commit my life to the one who saved me. Because had they not saved me, I wouldn't have a life at all anyway. Anybody hearing what I'm saying? So because the blood of Jesus was shed to save me, I will commit my life to serving him because if he had not saved me in the first place, I wouldn't even have a life today. If he hadn't died on the cross for me, I'd be on my way to a sinner's hell today. Had he not rose from the grave, victorious, having conquered death, hell, and the grave, I'd be tasting death one day myself. But because he rose, because he lives, and because he died, and now I'm saved. Now now I have eternal life. Now I can have a relationship with God. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Those that are being baptized, I want you to listen very carefully. You're going to get out of your seat and take your clothes and your towel, whatever. We have a baptism shirt we're going to give you. You're going to walk out the back or out the side, and you're going to meet over here in this hallway. You can change in the bathrooms. You can change in the green room. But if you're being baptized, just right now, get out. Go out these doors. You can change in the bathrooms, you can change in the green room, but you're just going to line up right here in that side hallway. Everybody's being baptized, okay? We're not dismissing. We're going to take part in this together today. See, the Word of God says that when one that was lost is found, the Bible says when just one soul comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is what the Bible says, not Pastor Josh's opinion. The Word of God says that all of the heavens rejoice. The heavens rejoice for that soul that was saved. How wonderful it is to know that when I was younger, when I made the decision to give my life to Jesus Christ, that heaven threw a party over me. See, some of us have lived lives where there's been a lot of pain. Some of us have lived lives where there's been a lot of letdown, a lot of discouragement, a lot of issues, a lot of adversity. And you feel like your life is a struggle. Does anybody really love me? Does anybody really care? Can I tell you today, there's not only is there somebody who cares, there's somebody who thought you were worth dying for. And he loves you. 
and we love you and you don't have to leave this building the same way you came in today I know we're talking about discipleship this has been so much of a, of a salvation message but I hope somebody can listen today and I want to talk to you everybody in this room today you don't have to leave here the same way you walked into this building today you don't have to leave here having beheld a service you don't have to leave here in the same spiritual condition you walked in on you can leave here today the same way these that are being baptized the same way I'm going to leave here today a blood bought child of the most high God who is saved and on their way to glory whose sins have been forgiven whose past has been erased and so what I'd like to do is if everybody could just bow our heads and close our eyes for just a minute